a roundup of the week's top local and national Coca-Cola Cup action. Granada Soccer Night, Wednesday, 11.30. Michael Barrymore's My Kind of People. People from every walk of life. Talented people. Emotional people. All with a burning desire to perform in public. Reaching the heart and soul. Michael Barrymore's My Kind of People. Thursday Magic, 8.30 on Granada. A reminder that at 12.40, Gabriel Clark presents the comprehensive goal show, NC League Extra. Now we jog your memory and take you back to the 70s for some classic action. One Brian Moore, a feast of football and faces from the 1970s. We'll be looking at some of the changes that have been taking place in the game. For instance, this new stretcher law, what's it all about? Well, they bring on a stretcher every time some midfielder sneezes. In the old days, you only got a stretcher if both your legs were broken. And then, you got a highly drilled team of top medical experts. You got Blakey from On The Buses, <laughs> Alfie Bass at the back, and some other guy just wandered on in the chance one of the players might be able to give him a light. <laughs> Finding that, you could always ask one of the coppers, like Constable Pipeweed over there on the left. <laughs> Tonight, we have another action-packed hour. We're at Old Trafford to see Sexton's Man United against Doherty's Derby. Couple, couple's cross. Oh, hit the bar by Greenock. And down at the valley for Charlton's Derek Hales. A great ball there from Bob Curtis. If Mike Flanagan can get onto it, and he might yet. Oh, and a good save there by Wieland. Oh, and just pushed wide. Before we go to the action, let me introduce my guests. Firstly, a man whose career began at Coldblow Lane and took him to the Windy City, entertaining in between at Man United, Derby and Queen's Park Rangers. Please welcome Gordon Hill. <laughs> and next to him, the man responsible for three of those moves, one of the most influential managers of his time, Tommy Doherty. <laughs> and the voice behind the specials, Fun Boy 3 and Colourfield, but before that, the voice behind the goals on the Stretford end, Terry Hall. <laughs> so, Terry, uh, how long have you been? You've always been a United fan? No, uh, I can remember at the age of five being... I, I was born in Coventry, right. and at the age of five being dragged to Coventry City by my dad, and I used to have to take a, a Watney's crate to stand on. But even so, I still miss the match. I was uh, like, uh, let me tell you, off. even on a Watney's crate, Coventry ain't worth watching. No, but every <laughs> time you got near the box, it used to fall off, so uh, <laughs> I didn't used to miss much. Uh, ever since. And, and Tommy and Gordon, you two then obviously have met before. I mean, what was it? Everywhere you went, you thought, I better have Gordon Hill with me. I was a great player. It was as simple as that. And uh, Dave Sexton obviously didn't want him after left Man U. And I came in my bid right away, and, and uh, we, we got him from most half as quick as we could. I bought him because he, he was a great player, scored goals, entertainer, and uh, he was just a great, great out and out, out to left. So, uh, Tommy Doherty obviously thinks the world of you. You worked for a, a lot of managers. Um, was he the best manager you ever worked on? Yes. And why? It's a good one. Um, he let me play. Right, he didn't try and stifle you in no. any way at all. All right, we're going to the game now. It's Old Trafford, 1978, where we witnessed the return of the native. Over to Gerald Sinstadt. And now to Old Trafford, where another big gate brings the total for league matches alone at Old Trafford this season almost to the half million mark. And Tommy Doherty is back. And the old relationship lingers on. As for the teams, Manchester United keep the side that won at Ipswich last week, which means no place in the back four for Brian Greenoff. In midfield, Sammy McElroy makes his 200th league appearance while Lou Macari will hope to celebrate five years at Old Trafford as he started with a goal. And this front line plays with the knowledge that next week, Joe Jordan will be available. One change has been forced on Derby County. Colin Todd had a cartilage removed this week, so Steve Powell is called in. 
The midfield includes two of Scotland's World Cup probables in Bruce Rioch and Don Masson. And just as he did at Old Trafford, Tommy Doherty likes to use two wingers. Here they are Terry Curran and Jerry Ryan. Mr Ken Baker from Rugby in Warwickshire is the referee. And Manchester United in red tops, white shorts, kick off attacking the goal to our left. Jimmy Greenoff. And the first foul of the game after only 15 seconds. Masson. Charlie George. Daly setting it up now for Curran. It's a good cross, and Buchan did well to get his head to it, but it's not yet clear. Now Macari's got it out. Green off. Couple. Couple running at Buckley. He's past Daniel. Still has Buckley to beat. He's got two in the middle. One is Pearson. And Langan it was who clear. Good work there by Koppel. And now he has another chance. And Hill. Six and a half minutes gone, and Steve Koppel does all the work down the right, and Hill was there to apply the finishing touch. Gordon Hill's tenth goal of the season. A lot of men up for Derby. Just left two back to cover Jimmy Green off, and everybody else is up in that penalty area. Daniel there, number five, poised for a run. Ten is Charlie George. But a short corner comes to nothing for Derby. And Greenoff gets away with a little barge and puts Hill in. He's onside. It is Hill versus Middleton. And he's going to try and chip him, has he? He's left it too late. And Middleton has saved. And Hill made a mess of it. Daly. Deflection, gives it to Hill. Pearson. And a good save by Middleton. McCurry is asking for a penalty, and the referee says yes indeed. Lou McCurry and Mr. Baker completely in accord, and a chance for Gordon Hill to get his second goal of the game. So we're just coming up to half-time. 2-0 to Manchester United. This is Ryan. Koppel. Well cut out by Langan, but Macari has found the man. Green off it is, and through goes Hill, and Middleton did very well there, because Hill was searching for his hat-trick. Another fine build-up by Manchester United. Buchan bursting forward again. Pearson. Wrestling with Buckley and coming out with the ball. Macari's chip, precisely finding Koppel. Koppel's cross. Oh, hit the ball! by Greenoff and Macari over the top an offside flag off but what a brilliant move that was Ronnie George enjoying a joke with uh, Stuart Houston Pearson McElroy Hill Ward across to Kari going to make a fifth as it goes over, and it was Pearson's flick, and that is 3-0. Gordon Hill, who scored the first two goals, had time to calculate and then deliver the cross, and a flick of those powerful Stuart Pearson neck muscles did the rest. That's his 50th league goal for Manchester United. Today's attendance, 57,115, only a few hundred short of the best of the season. Couple to Pierce.
Larkin. Makari always there. And the header by Hill, touched over by Middleton. And the hat-trick attempt thwarted again. Manchester United fans wondering whether one last shove might not give them a fourth goal. come here and can Martin Buchan score it yes he can the Derby defense pulled apart and more or less at a standstill as the passes opened them up and Martin Buchan went through to make it four scoring his second goal for Manchester United since he came to Old Trafford his previous goal scored in April 1972, so he'll be well pleased with this game. Houston, and the final whistle goes at the end of a most convincing performance by Manchester United. Two goals from Gordon Hill, Stuart Pearson getting his 50th league goal for the club and the skipper Martin Buchan rounding it off. 4-0 and Tommy Doherty's return to Old Trafford ends in defeat. No shortage of action there. After the break, I'll be talking to Gordon, Tommy and Terry, plus some other very special guests. There's still action to come from Derek Hale's Charlton against Hull, plus a look at the battle for United's green jersey. Hit under that crossbar. Oh, and he pushed it in! I'm Stephanie Granger. I'm 43. I've used Oil of Ule since I was 17. Beauty fluid from Oil of Ule. Living proof it works. We regret to announce the delay of... We can't control air traffic control, but we can control your heart burn. Pepsid AC. To keep your family's clothes wonderfully white, Fairy introduce a new improved liquid that gives your whole family's wash a brilliant new fairy whiteness. And it's still as caring as it's always been. If you want them to be bright, new Improved Fairy is a touch of brilliance for your family's whites. How hungry was I? Mighty double hungry. So, where did I go? Straight to KN4. One mighty double burger coming right up, she said. I thought I was seeing double. Two white chicken pieces, lettuce, mayo, and tangy barbecue sauce on a long sesame bun. Mmm, mighty double value, mighty double taste. So, where to? KFC! On the double, the mighty double. The KFC mighty double, and all for only 2 15 <laughs> The new Almira will take it for a test drive. Of course. Alone. Great fun to drive. Mm. Comfortable too. Multi-link beam suspension. <laughs> <laughs> The car they don't want you to drive. Welcome back. Gordon Hill, Tommy Doherty and Terry Hall are here to discuss United's 4-0 victory over Derby County. Uh, starting with you, Mr Doherty. Not, not the happiest homecoming, then. What makes you think that, Bob? Because you've got to be 4-0. <laughs> Well, that was nothing unusual when I was a manager. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit difficult because, uh, obviously, we'd won the Cup in the, in the mm. May against Liverpool uh, at Wembley, and it was all the team that we'd brought together. Mm. Uh, Tommy Carver and I at Man United. Great side, good set of lads. And uh, then, all of a sudden, I've left in the summer. You left, didn't you? Well, I nicked off with the physio's wife, yeah. Ah, right. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> obviously the dispenser of my services and right. uh, I got the Derby job just at the beginning of the season, took over from uh, uh, Colin Murphy and uh, Shanks used to call him Danny O'Grady, uh, Danny O'Grady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Danny O'Grady? Yeah, Shanks used to call him, uh, <laughs> who's now doing a marvellous job, has done for the last ten years at Crewe. Yeah. And uh, I sort of inherited a team that, in a way, Cluffy had built together, which mm. was just coming to the end of his bit. They'd already won the championship twice mm. at Derby, and uh, they'd lost their hunger, the players, but all wanted to have a way. The funny thing about it was I'd sold Jerry Daly to Derby County and here I was the manager of Derby and mm. sort of re-inherit and Derek again. Um, and that was all right. I just want to say, I know that you, you, you always give this impression of, you know, you move about and it's that you don't seem to care very much, but that, that must have been a real sickener when, when you went from United. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not to say that you don't care. I mean, that was a job that I dreamed of mm. since I was that high. I mean, a great club, great supporters and... Uh, Great stadium and, and, and good players. Not easy, not difficult to get the players to, to go there. And every club you go to as a manager, you hope really, you don't want to be dragging your family all over the country every two or three weeks. Yeah. You know, you want to go there. And I had a great time at Chelsea as well when I was at Stamford Bridge, which mm. was brilliant. And you, I think every manager goes to a club with good intentions. But uh, people say, why do you have so many jobs as a manager? Well, because uh, the clubs that, that you go to have been dissatisfied with the manager that they've had already. And he gets a sack. And, and you move into his place, it's like musical chairs, just as people have moved into my job and I've been in the clubs as well. Yeah, well, I was obviously very disappointed because I felt we were on the verge of really outstanding Being a great side, and it must have been very emotional that day. We saw a bit of it at the beginning. Yeah, of well, I've, I've always had a good repartee with, especially the Manchester United support, mm. have been brilliant to me. Even though I go now, they, get, they, get, they give me a very good reception, very, very nice. Right, and this man here, Gordon Hill, the ever talkative Mr Gordon Hill here, um, that, that, was a, that was a good game for you, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't just because uh, TD was the, the boss of Derby. I think we were still playing the way we were playing when we, were, we won the Cup, Yeah, uh, which was nice. And, 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 you know, he put that pattern into us, and that's the way we were going to play. Well, well, talk, well, what about that, Pat, in case there's anyone here who didn't well, see that side? That was, it was a very exciting kind of short passing, skillful game, wasn't it? Yeah, we were very... I mean, uh, our team talks were, we don't mind them scoring two as long as we score three. I mean, teams used to fear coming to Old Trafford. Mm. I mean, we had, uh, I would say, one of the best lineups up front, even now. And uh, to, to see uh, Stevie, who was a, an absolute great player, mm. uh, his work rate was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and you had uh, an English centre forward like Stuart Pearson, who could, uh, you know, my job was to get the ball in there, and, and that's what I was told. I get the ball in there in the right places, and you'll find one or two people in there. It's either Jimmy Greenoff or Stewie Pearson, and the backup line was Lou McCurry, who would, and, and Sammy McElroy, mm. and that was my job. And, and also, if the going got rough, you were always willing to go back and help defend, weren't you, Gordon? I couldn't defend. I mean, <laughs> people. No, I mean, no. I mean, I wasn't paid to defend. I was. I mean, you know, people were under this illusion that, that I go back and stop it. I mean, that's what my departure from Old Trafford was. Right. I mean, uh, Stevie would score five or six goals and be happy with it. I would be happy with less than twenty goals a season. Uh, it's very difficult in, it, it, for me to be able to uh, go into fence and stop 20, go up front, and physically I, I just couldn't do it. And, right. uh, you know, I got a nosebleed every time I went over the halfway. Right, and, and you were quite, as a manager, you were quite happy with that? Yeah, well, we, see, we used to have, have two wings, Coppel and, and Pancho was great mm. up front with Jimmy Greenham. When the ball went to them, it stuck. They got hold of it, and no one could get it off them. And they're very quick and good goal scorer. We used to say to Hilly, when you're not in possession, get any position. You right. know, a good attacking position is a good defensive position. Right. So he would just go into a sort of deep position in the touchline. So when Alec got the ball out of the step of the full box, he was easy to find. Then we yeah. took it from there. Right, let's, let's have a look at how, how it worked. Do you want to have another look at that goal? Uh, I don't. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't. No, I, don't. <laughs> I might get a new contract. Yeah, I might. Let, <laughs> let, let, let's have a look at the goal, shall we? Good work there by Koppel, and now he has another chance. And Hill! Six and a half minutes gone, and Steve Koppel does all the work down the right, and Hill was there to apply the finishing touch. The great thing about a Gordon Hill, what makes him a great striker, isn't just that he scores goals, but like people who are great at something, they teach, they show others the way it should be done. Watch Gordon here, after, he's, after this rather spectacular miss, just, just watch what he does. Greenoff gets away with a little barge and puts Hill in. He's onside, it is Hill versus Middleton. And he's going to try and chip him, has he? He's left it too late and Middleton has saved and Hill made a mess of it. That's it. Now, that's what I was... Now, if you're ever in that position, lads, 
You have to do that. Go round yeah. the keeper like that. Yeah, I should have hit it first time. I should have bent it round. You should have hit it yeah. first time. I don't want to give you advice, Gord, but you should have hit it first time. I lost my bonus. And just swung him round like that into, into the... Top left-hand corner, but <laughs> it wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it was a great goal. And uh, somebody else... <laughs> It's a great goal, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've scored plenty of them, but... Yeah, well, let me finish. <laughs> it was a great was goal getting... that went in, though, in that game, which is what I was going to say, yeah. uh, from a colleague, uh, a colleague of yours and another superb striker, uh, and we're going to see that right now. Four to cross to. Akari going to make a fifth as it goes over, and it was Pearson! There you go, a great goal from Gordon's striking partner and another of our very special guests tonight. Please welcome Stuart Pearson. <laughs> Stuart, first, can I, can I just ask you one thing, because uh, Tommy Doherty mentioned it, Pancho. Pancho, yeah, I got that when I was at Hull City and TD had a... Uh, how long there, TD, a year? Yeah. yeah well, not um, that long. Not that long, no, I don't usually last that long at close. <laughs> that, that, hang on, that, but that was, uh, that was with, that would be no, with Terry Neal? Under Terry Neal, yeah. So you worked for Terry Neal? Uh, yes, uh, well, some people say I didn't, but I think I did, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was assistant manager to Terry for about six months. Now, and why Pancho, just to get it out of the way? Well, a uh, centre forward cost called Chris Chilton, he started calling me. Um, I think there was an ex-Man United player called right. Pearson yeah, who had called uh, oh, right. Pancho, so then it stuck. And then when TD came to United, he started calling me. Right, and he it, thought, it stuck oh, God, not again. <laughs> now I'm going to have to have the Pancho tag all yeah. over again. What, were, what was it like playing, playing uh, in that team in general, but in particular with this man? Who were Gordon? Yeah. We well, see, when anybody mentions the name Gordon Hill, everybody thinks he's a funny man, he's this and that, but he, he's the best goal-scoring winger I've ever seen. Um, I'm not going about the Finneys and all them players because I didn't really see them play. But, but Gordon was a natural. He, he, he crossed great balls for me, but he was also a great goal scorer. And he was a joy to play with. That goal I just scored then, I'd, I made four runs then. Because you've got to know your players, you see. He, made, he went to clip it first time with his left, and then he pulled it back on his right. And <laughs> so you've got to know your players. And I and knew that, Gordon. Just yeah. as you're hanging around that box all day, basically. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, what, about, what about Mr Doherty as a boss? Well, TD is a... Uh, different class for me. I mean, it, it got the players playing, everybody felt relaxed, the training wasn't over the top, we, we all felt like playing on, on the Saturday. Everybody felt relaxed and it was just the way he went about it. He never put any pressure on his players. And like Gordon said, if, if we knew he was going to get beat, not beat, if somebody was going to score two goals, we always knew we was going to get three or four. Okay. And it, it was great to play. You then went to, because, you know, we've got a huge London following, you then, of course, went down to West Ham. Well, West Ham, great club. I, I enjoyed uh, three super years there, and everybody says, why did you go there? Uh, it was a money problem at Man United, but I went there and I won three medals, and United were going through a sticky spell and they never won anything for three years, so I always say I won three medals. We beat Arsenal in the FA Cup, we won the second division championship medal, and I also uh, got a runners-up medal against Liverpool in the, uh, in the Milk Cup or the League Cup, as it was. Right. Yeah, the, the league Great cup. Great times, yeah. All, all the younger people won't remember that. And also, yeah. another phrase you won't, you won't recognise, money troubles at Man United. <laughs> yeah. well, well, been, but that's always been the case. Yeah. <laughs> In our time at Old Trafford, uh, we had a lad called Jimmy Green, if he was a brilliant player. And he took £50 a week less... Why, to, to come to United? To come to United. Stoke yeah. City were paying him 50 quid a week more wow. than he was getting to Manchester United. Money was always difficult at Old Trafford. Really? Days. Yeah. Because yeah. I thought they were... They, uh... Well, they looked upon it, and, and t you could understand to a certain extent, they looked upon it as it's a privilege and pleasure to play for us. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you should, you know, never mind the money. You should say, don't, don't chase the money, the money will find you. I signed uh, with TD, and the day I signed, and I remember it distinctly because I'd left Millwall, and then I, I signed for the boss, and I'm walking out. I said, "Oh, by the way, how much am I going to get?" No, really, that yeah, you signed that the contract. Yeah. yeah, I think you play for the because it's the club, yeah. and and you walk out, and and so Matt Musby was walking up and down. So I think that adds a little bit to it. I mean, right. and you just you're there, you know, you you're right in the middle of that club, and it's. The but what, but particularly, what was it like for you? Because you were, uh, I mean, you're you're a cockney, and you was down, you was uh -huh. little and all that, and you came. What was that like? Well, up to I, Manchester. I, well, I. No I disrespect really to Manchester, know, by the no, way. I, I, didn't, I didn't really know much about it. The night before, um, I was told to pack my boots by the Millwall manager, Jago. 
and he said that the club have got to sell you money reasons. Mm. The bank have said sure. sell. Sure. So next morning, six o'clock, I picked my boots up and I'm at Euston Station and I didn't know where I was going. And where did you think you were going? Well, I, Arsenal and Tottenham had, had come in mm -hmm. with the bids. Terry Neal was then at the time and come in with the bids. Then all of a sudden, I Joe said, oh, by the way, he said, you're going to, to Manchester, you're talking to United. Uh, we've agreed to find, you know, the, the fee. And I think it, it's only then that it hits you. You go, oh, United. And I mean, we played against them in the second division and, and, and the second division thanked United for being there because they brought big crowds yeah, and the, the yeah. revenue. And of course, yeah. the first thing you do when you go up there is this big stadium. And I'd only played in it against them. And mm. to actually go there and to be one of the, you know, uh, shall we say the final jigsaw puzzle, mm. you know, the piece, uh, and, and to meet these great people. And I mean, it, you can't but help sign. I mean, people say, yeah, you talk about the money, but right. it wasn't the money. It was actually playing on, on the hallowed turf and, and playing with such great names. Wow. Well, what's this all about? Terry, you're, you're a fan. Is that the way you feel about it at, at, at United? No, I agree. I mean, it's like, like recently with that Russian bloke moving to Everton. It's like... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, th I think he knows his name. I couldn't spit it I out. I think he's just calling him that Russian bloke So now. you move over from Russia where you're on, like, 150 cabbages a week, and it's like... Uh, <laughs> yeah. You've got a bonus. But to put that shirt on is such, a, such an yeah. honour. And then to moan about... Or should I be on three, four, five, six grand a week? It's, I just find it really disgusting. Yeah. Really disgusting. I, I got to agree with him. And then he rubbed it in by going to Evan as well, that, that Russian bloke. Well, he's had ten minutes there yesterday, so... Uh... And then, <laughs> let me just move on, though, because there was one very noticeable uh, absence from the Man United team that we've just seen, and that was this man. Alex Stepney, with his solid dependability and his mysterious white gloves, was the undisputed goalkeeping hero of the Stratford End throughout the 70s. His fine positional sense meant that only rarely did he have to use his quite amazing agility. Low and hard, and oh, a magnificent save! As with all great goalkeepers, he had undoubted courage. Anybody who'd be willing to go down at the feet of McDonald must be worth his pay. By the time the Derby County game came around, however, Alex had been languishing in the reserves for some time, controversially dropped by the charismatic Dave Sexton to make way for the ever so slightly less dependable Paddy Roach. <laughs> well, it's there for number three. Whether it goes to Armstrong or whether it was punched in by the goalkeeper Roach, that's what the players themselves will have to decide. Arsenal 1, Manchester United... Nil. What's this goal by Alan Ball? Not the greatest shot in the world, and you can't help wondering if maybe a better class of goalkeeper wouldn't have, I don't know, caught it? <laughs> in the end, even Brian had to raise an eyebrow at his antics. It's a funny thing for the goalkeeper. Rose to do, he was quite unmolested there. Could safely have caught it. And I'm delighted to say the man in the white gloves is with us here tonight. Please welcome Alex Stepney. <laughs> Paddy Roach, the reason Paddy was in that game was that you had been considered kind of, you know... End of my career. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't going to say that. But the feeling was with Dave Sexton that you'd perhaps seen better days. And, he, and he, mm. what, what was the situation there? Well, I don't think... Uh, I, I think, actually, at that time, I broke my hand and I was coming back through the reserves, but... The thing was, I mean, I played under five managers at Old Trafford, probably more than any other player who's ever played for them. <coughs> uh, and I was dropped by every one, even the dot, you know. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but I played like 600 games, so I must have been consistent somewhere along the line. What, what's it like, and I don't know if we're going to get an honest answer here, but what's it like if you're sitting in the stands as, as the goalkeeper, watching Paddy Roach and he, he makes mistakes? Is it a feeling of... I'll have a chat with Paddy and tell him what he should have done afterwards, or is it yes? I don't know, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I was about 18, it would have been yes. <laughs> but at that stage of my career, no, it, you know, like, um, I felt sorry for him, actually. Right, so you played with five managers. One of them was this uh, gentleman here. H how do you rate him? Well, actually, Tommy signed me uh, from Millwall. I, was, I, was at, I started at Millwall, same as Gordon, and uh, Tommy signed me uh, for Chelsea. Now, let's... Uh, all right, let's, let's do it. He signed you for Chelsea. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, and if I am, please jump in, to replace Peter Bonetti, who was going. 
Well, it wasn't going, but Peter had been tapped up by West Ham in the summer of the World Cup. 66. Tapped up? Yeah. That sort of thing didn't go on? Yes, it no. did. Oh, so, did. All right, yes, it did. So... <laughs> <laughs> and I've got news for you, it's still going on. <laughs> so, hang on, Peter had been on England duty. Yeah. And, and someone from West Ham had made a very proper approach to Chelsea. A proper approach, right, yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Peter had been tapped up, as and they say. Uh, then we come back after the World Cup and Peter was a bit... He wasn't Peter, he was a lovely lad, super lad, great yeah. goalkeeper. So I got Alec, who was playing magnificently for Millwall. Right. And I, my intention was to play them alternate weeks. Uh, one week Alec, one next week Peter Benetti. That, that was your, that was... That was my theory. And, and how do you think that would have worked? Uh, I don't think it would have worked at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it's true, I could see Peter moving to West Ham. Right. So it, Alec was extra insurance for me. Right. But then what happened all of a sudden, very, very quickly, Sir Matt Busby, God rest his soul, he came down to see me with Jimmy Murphy, he said, I want one of your goalkeepers. Just, I'll have, what have you got? Yeah, I, no, he knew who I had. Right. I said, which one do you want? I said, either of them. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, well, I said, well, you can have the boy step me. I said, because I was a bit of trouble with Peter. Yeah. Uh, and Alex played the game. He's right. played the game. So we agreed a fee of 50 grand. So I made 20 grand profit in, in quite a few months. And Alex went on to do great things at Old Trafford. Brilliant European Cup, the whole lot, right. championships and a lot. And I was pleased right. for him because he was very hard-working goalkeeper, good pro, right. and uh, he played the game with The most important thing, he played the game with me, yeah. and I like to think I played the game with him at right. that particular stage. Right. In October 1976, with First Division matches cancelled for World Cup preparations, the big match went on a rare trip to the Second Division, visiting the Valley, where Charlton and Hull responded magnificently. Over to Brian. Here's the Charlton team. Wood in goal, a back four of Berry, Giles, Curtis and Warman, in the middle, Bowman, Hunt and Peacock, and then up front, Powell, Hales and Flanagan with Hammond the substitute. As for Hull City, this is their side. Whelan's in goal, a back four of Daniel, Haig, Croft and De Vries. Four in the middle as well, Hawley, Nisbet, Billy Bremner and Galvin. And then up front, Sunley and Hemmerman with their substitute, Staniforth. And the referee today at the Valley is Ken Baker from Rugby. And the crowd, just over 10,000, waits for the start. So Hull City now kick off. Attacking the goal to our left, in white shirts, black shorts. Charlton in their customary red with white shorts. Hull, who've not made uh, a bad start to this season, lying seventh in the table. And with the impetus of Billy Bremner hoping that they can go on improving on that. Well, that was a bad start there for Paul Haig, the number six. Blonde-haired lad with the Uli Hernis haircut. A little bit of aggression there, sending Colin Powell on his way. For Charlton. Flanagan making a well timed run. Oh my goodness, with almost a goal and really a beautiful run by Flanagan. That cross came floating in. Flanagan on the far side of the defence. But wide of the post. Now here's Hammond. Powell again. Little mix through there for Bowman. Croft away. Giles. Al to, G uh, to Jim Giles. And another corner to Charlton. That time off Stuart Cook. So the big number five that they brought from Exeter stays up. Colin Powell takes another corner for Charlton. Again, floated in there. A few hitters there. And Hales! Clipped in very well indeed there by Bowman for Flanagan. Hales again. Oh, and he missed his kick. So Haig for Hull. What an out of half time. 1 0. This is the fellow who's scored the goal, Derek Hales. Galvin. Bowman doing uh, well to stick with him. Everybody claiming it's their ball. The linesman giving it to Hull. Roger de Vries. Chris Galvin. 
Colin Powell for Charlton. To Hales. A little touch for Hunt. Powell again. Long raking stride. Warm. Powell has continued his run. Warman couldn't quite pick him up, but now he has. Well, he's gone past him. And he's got a good cross in. Oh, what a goal! Hales again! A mastery goal by the man who always seems to get them. Derek Hales. Colin Powell coming across to congratulate him. And Powell's work in it was tremendous. Down that left-hand side. Jimping and darting and finally getting it across. And what about that for a volley on the turn? Derek Hales, his second goal, and the second for Charlton. Nisbet. Now Daniel has become to injury time at the end of the first half. Sunley. And now Hawley. Fair little chip in there towards Galvin. Well, are they going to get something? Yes, they have, right on half time. Hull have pulled one back through Chris Galvin. And really, there seemed to be no danger when that ball came floating in and there'll be an inquest in that Charlton defence. As to how it was that Galvin could have room on that far post. And whacked it in to the roof of that Charlton net. Very scrappy first 11 minutes of the second half. That great ball there from Bob Curtis. If Mike Flanagan can get onto it, and he might yet. Oh, and a good save there by Wheeland. Oh, and just pushed wide by Derek Hales. Well, Charlton nearly made something out of nothing there, but what a great ball from Bob Curtis. Flanagan was onto it. He slipped. He picked himself up. He brought out a good save from Wheelands, and Derek Hales was what? A yard away from getting a hat trick. Giles winning that one as well. Here's Bremer. Telling Hawley to get down the wing. It's with Daniel. Bremner making a run as well. That's a nice ball played for Billy Bremner. And Wood's in a bit of trouble. But he did the second time just before Hawley got in. But that was the great influence there of Billy Bremner. Making a lovely dash down there. The ball was played nicely for him. Hales beautifully timed on again. Really stretching those legs. Brought down free kick. is supercharged over the first 10 yards. Rover tied in a defence that gives him a yard or two in the box. Down go the socks, off come the pads. Charlton prepare to take this free kick. Five minutes to go, Peacock's going to take it. Hales looking for a hat-trick. Berry coming up fast from the back. Six foot two defender. It won't reach him. And it's there by Hales, it's his hat-trick. Pads in one hand, arm aloft, ball in the back of the net. As that came across the face of the Hull goal, it didn't look as though it would possibly get to Hales, but it did on the far side, and again he got in low. Pass Wheelands into the back of the net. Hull coming as seventh in the table, they'll lose a place or two now, I would think as they are beaten here tonight by three goals to one. All three goals for Charlton Athletic, coming from the man who knows all about scoring. Derek Hales taking his tally with those three today to 13 for the season, and still increasing further the price on his head. Chris Galvin having scored the sole goal for Hull City right on the stroke of half-time. So, uh, final scoreline at the Valley. Charlton 3, Hull 1. Fabulous game. And I'm very pleased to say that the man of that match has joined us. Please welcome Derek Hales. <laughs> we'll be chatting to Derek and some other very special guests in a few moments. Plus, perhaps the most important trophy any professional can win. Forget the Jules Rimet, forget the FA Cup. Take a look at the build-up that they gave to this one. Now it's time for Golden Goals of 1971.
Time to serve us. Oh! From the producers of Top Gun and director of True Romance. We're here to preserve democracy, not to practice it. Comes one of America's biggest box office successes. The UK critics are thunderous in their applause for one of the most eagerly awaited action films this year. I'm assuming command of this ship. You're not assuming anything. Sir, he's right on top of us! Lock him in his stateroom. I'm the commander of this ship! Now! Crimson Tide. of pure cream. By heck, you smell gorgeous tonight, pal. <sighs> Pamper yourself with Boddington's The Cream of Manchester. There is a wonderful recipe from this region, and the secret is starting with the finest ingredients. Take them and carefully peel. Just right, don't stop, don't stop. Then, to bring out the flavor, beat together. Just right. Take a lemon and squeeze. Ginger and grate. And simply bring to the boil. Feel good enough to eat. Addiction by Fabergé. Fragrances for men and women. We've just seen Charlton hammer hull with Derek Hales getting all three Charlton goals. Derek, that was a good match? Uh, as far as I can remember. Put yourself really. about a bit as well, didn't you? Um, not really, no. You was running up and down a lot more than most Charlton fans would remember, I think. I did the best I could. But... I think, well, I know the point that Derek noticed here, uh, that Gordon noticed, you're Derek, the bit that Gordon noticed <laughs> watching me, was that uh, in the second half you had to take your shin pads off because you got cramped, is that right? I did get cramped towards the end there. <laughs> and, uh, not very well, nice when you get Just tell it. us, in case, again, Sorry. the younger people might not know, what kind of a player were you? Were, were you a kind of industrious, Perryman couple, get, up and down? I was down just the... a pure no. goal-getter waiting for all the service I could have. I mean, at that particular time, I had good service from the likes of Colin Powell, Keith Peacock and Mike Flanagan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I did the best I could, but I wasn't too bad. Oh, you know, you must have been pretty good because uh, Derby came in and paid, what was it, how much did they pay for you? 300 grand or something? Uh, a lot of people said they paid too much. 333,000 pounds they paid yes, for you. Yes, they did. That's, that's what the I remember got. Francis that's Lee true. saying they paid too much for you. My right hook is better than his. Is that what he said? <laughs> no, that's what I told him. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but he I'm said they paid too much for you. That's what he told me, yeah. Uh, well, so you went to, uh, to, to Derby and eventually you ran into this man, of course. I did run into Tommy, yeah. Uh, I'd been there a few months and uh, I wasn't getting on too good. I didn't particularly like it there, which was... What, what was the matter with it? Well, it was a difficult situation at the time. They had a caretaker manager and uh, the chairman was a, was a nice chap. And uh, they were restructuring, as I thought, but uh, they were an older team and there was a lot of internationals there, older internationals, mm. and I was not one and Colin Bolton was not one. I mean, it was two out of, a, of the 11 that played at the time. And uh, I struggled to get a few goals early on. I went to see Tommy and I said, well, I said, I'm not really hitting it off here. I said, uh, I wonder if you can do me a favour and I need to get away. I mean, so the, the first question you asked of your new boss was, uh, any, <laughs> any chance of me slipping off, basically? Well, I, I, need, I needed to get back home, really. What, what was it like when you went back there? At West Ham, you played 28 games, 10 goals. It was a good average, but then you, you yeah. finished off. Yeah, there, not too bad. I mean, a struggling side. I mean, we, we weren't, uh, we weren't uh, a good side at the time. I mean, we were struggling, I mean, which is a fair ratio right. in, in a struggling side. I mean... Yeah. I mean <laughs> <laughs> when you're up there, when it's struggling, it's bloody hard. Right. But, I mean, even at Derby... I mean, I lasted longer at Derby than Tommy did. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really saying much, though, is it? Let's no, I was a year and a half at Derby. Oh, really? <laughs> was you? Yeah. 
You sure? Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, I've you got a that. clock and everything there when yeah. he went. Oh, got a tanker, the whole, tanker, lot. The whole yeah, lot there. Yeah. That was one of my longest stays, that's oh. what I remember. And then, and then of course, you went... <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'll play more games than you, Tom. Well, you probably did, especially yeah. Derby. You went, you went back to Charlton, <laughs> then? So, basically, yes. that's, that's your love, isn't it? It's Charlton. Yes, it was, yeah. All the other places yeah. you've been to. never been very ambitious. Yeah. But the one thing they can never take away from uh, from Derek Howes, because his beard's gone, all right, They've, he's lost that, is, uh, is this fabulous goal. Well. The fabulous goal which earned him the, the highest accolade. Let, let's, let's have a look at this. Alan Carl for Charlton. To Hales. A little touch for Hunt. Foul again. Long raking strike. Warm. Carl has continued his run. Warman couldn't quite pick him up, but now he has. Well, he's gone past him. And he's got a good cross in. Oh, what a goal! Hales again! A mastery goal by the man who always seems to get them. Derek Hales. Colin Powell coming across to congratulate him. And Powell's work in it was tremendous. Down that left-hand side. Jimping and darting and finally getting it across. And what about that for a volley on the turn? Derek Hales his second goal and the second for Charlton. One of, one of the classic goals, really, because it started at one end of the pitch, <coughs> it went right across the pitch, Colin Powell picked it up, took it, and then it came, and it won the, the, golden, goal, uh, the golden Goal Award, sorry, for that year. And we have, we have got some film of that to, to see you getting your award. And, but there's one thing uh, for, the, for the modern viewer that I'd, I'd like you to just watch. Just, just listen to this. You see? Nothing at all, because television has cracked the problem of the squeaky chair. But unfortunately, it wasn't like that in the 70s. So have a look and have a listen to this. Derek, I'm sure, will be delighted to hand you your little trophy. Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair, <bad>, Judge. <laughs> and Derek, I've got great pleasure in uh, giving you the Golden Girls Trophy. Thanks of 1977, well. and I hope your luck changes a hell of a lot uh, at the start of next season Thanks and uh, the goals start coming back again. And in fact, there's a video master, one of those lovely machines that allow you to play various sports on your own television screens that goes to all three of you, to Derek Hales, to Colin Powell, and to John Jordan as well. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you very much for coming in today. This is the coupon that uh, John sent in, and you'll see that he's got them in the right order. From Thamesmead, London, SE2. Well done, Brian. Uh, not only has you told everyone that the guy's won a video master, but you've also given his name and address out to everybody in South East London. Yeah, good move. Uh, here's the trophy. There we are. The big match Golden Goals competition. Do you keep that pride of place in your house, yeah? Uh, it's, it's always been there, hasn't it? You had it. You, we came, we got it right in the middle of the mantelpiece like that. Everyone who comes around, look at that. I won this award, but I'm sure that Derek would be the first to agree that that goal wouldn't have been possible without our special guest tonight. Would you please welcome Colin Powell is with us, and with him, former Charlton captain and now reserve team coach, Keith Peacock. <laughs> so, uh, Colin, first, that was your goal, really, wasn't it? Um, well, I suppose so, but I, I, I've never really run that far in a season, let alone a match, <laughs> and... Um, I mean, it's a special goal, I suppose. Took yeah. it, but you took it the full length of the pitch, knocked it over, and then he just happened to be there swinging the leg, yeah? Yeah, it's a lucky sort of strike that you used to get every now and again. <laughs> you see, if, th if this was an American guy, you'd have got an assist, you see, in the States. So, Colin, uh, Charlton, and, and very long-serving at Charlton, still there, yeah? Yeah, I'm groundsman now at the Valley Bob. And, and, and how's that? What, what was the transition? So, did you just stay there all the time? Yeah, they couldn't get rid of me. Yeah. I just sort of stayed. I've always so, well, he's, enjoyed it. He's still here. He's not that quick anymore. <laughs> we better we we better give him a rake and a lawnmower. I, oh, I, I actually nearly got a game last year. So <laughs> yeah, th things that bad. So, but it's nice to be back at the road. And and what, what was it like playing with this man? Well, I mean, you know, our job really was just to get the ball in the box as, as much as we could, and he would finish it off. I mean, he was, uh, you know, a brilliant finisher really. And sitting next to you there is Mr. Keith Peacock. Now, again, about Derek Flick, yes, we know he was a great goal scorer. Was he a slightly over-aggressive player at all? Did he ever get into any kind of trouble that you might like to tell us about? Well, uh, I don't know if I should tell you. Oh, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were times, I mean, when Derek's first training session, um, that I can remember, I, I nicknamed him Killer, really. He, that went into the fact that he killed off every opportunity in the box. But 
I mean, I named him Killer because he was so lethal in the training field, I thought any of us could be killed off instantly, you know. Right. He was one of his wild tales. But he, he would lose his temper now and again, and it overflowed probably once in, in one game when with Mike Flanagan. What, uh, what, uh, what, remind us of that. What was that? <laughs> well, we were having a disaster. We played, Mason were a very lowly non-league side at the time. And they were turning you over? And we, we were drawing 1-1, and we were having a terrible time. Right. Um, we were lucky to be 1-1. And uh, Flanagan was playing probably a little bit better than the others. He would have probably got about three out of ten, you know. And he was running through. He scored the only goal. He's running through. He should have either passed the ball to myself or Derek. He, uns he selfishly shot. There was a little bit of a fracas after the next thing. Uh, Derek and uh, Mike were having a fist fisty cuffs, you know. And uh, Paddy was close by, but he was the last one to get there to intervene. <laughs> <laughs> And they told me he was quick. You know? Right. I, I got there just after him. Right, Paddy Power was obviously thinking, well, there's a fight going on, but just look <laughs> at this turf here now. Uh, what I'd do with this bit of turf is, uh, Derek, uh, is that pretty much as you remember it? A bit of a fracas? Well, no, I can't remember it as well as that. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I can't remember it. I thought we were 1 0 down at the time. Oh, so you don't remember the score, basically, but you remember. Uh, whatever. Well, I mean, I thought we were 1 0 down at the time when it happened, but I mean. Mm. So what, you, what you're going to ask me, Bob, I mean, is, is something about the situation that happened then. Uh, it happened months and months before then. Mm. Right. There was talking three months before this. Right. And then when it happened, it wouldn't have mattered if it had been in your house, the right. chapel, it would have happened. OK, um, there's something else I just want to pick up from that Charlton game. This is for the younger viewers who might be surprised to see the idols of the sporting game actually wearing beards. These days, it's something you only really associate with mountain climbers or Matthew Kelly. But in the 70s, let me tell you, a man was measured by his bum fluff. Got a good cross in. Oh, what a goal! Down at the valley, it wasn't just Derek. Even Keith Peacock was sporting a little moustache. Bob Curtis went for the geography teacher look. <laughs> While Peter Hunt was often picked on by spiteful opponents, jealous of his Clint Eastwood good looks. Over at West Ham, Billy Bonds had a beard, but unlike some of the other players, it wasn't a fashion statement. He shaved every morning. But like teammate Frank Lampard, by the time kickoff arrived, the damn thing had grown again. <laughs> Golden boy Graham Padden, on the other hand, simply wasn't old enough to use a razor. <laughs> Up at Anfield, Joey Jones couldn't grow a beard, so they had to spend 300 grand on the Hirsute Alan Kennedy. Alan Kennedy, now. I feel sorry for Joey Jones, but... Uh... It's one of them things in it, you know. Same problem at White Hart Lane. To bolster their return to the First Division, they ended up importing a couple of mean, gum-chewing beardies from Buenos Aires. The two Argentines who have so caught the public imagination. The greatest beard, of course, belonged to the late lamented Trevor Hockey, a growth so luxuriant it actually mesmerised <laughs> opposing keepers. Trevor Hockey, a great player, sadly missed. One last thing, just before we go, and Terry, you're going to be with me on this. This is from a fan's perspective. It's just a plea to all the strikers playing in the modern game. Do us a favour. If you're a player, don't go scoring just before half-time because you can cause some very, very embarrassing problems, as they found out in this match. Have a look. Fair little chip in there towards Galvin. Well, now, that's what a manager there. wants to see, is a player scoring just before half-time. But if it is before half-time, you're starting to think, I want a wee. You don't want to make it to the toilets, but you think, well, it doesn't matter. None of the cameras are going to be on this part of the ground now because no one's going to score, but of course they do. And you get a chap in this situation. Oh, no, hang on. Oh, no, they're pointing the camera at me. Oh, but hang on, I'll just, I'll just do it up then, shall I? <laughs> you, get, you get caught on television having a wee, all right? It's as simple as that. All right, Terry, I'm presuming that that never happened to you. And th actually, that was me. So. <laughs> but that doesn't happen yeah, in many eyes, because at Old Trafford, you want to go to the toilet, you just get up out of your seat in the director's box, move along yeah, there, right. or the big yeah. executive yeah, bar right. with the flush toilets. It's all like that, isn't it? Mm, yeah? yeah? Not at all, no. I mean, it's like uh, there are fans and there are you know, other words uh, that begin with W usually, uh, but I sort of <laughs> tend to stick with the fans, but I do miss a lot of goals. Yeah. And, uh, I've started taking my young boy, who sort of goes every five, ten minutes, and anyway, right. so, uh, But he, he loves going, yeah? Well, he does. It was a throw. I took him to uh, Villa last season. He was sort of overawed, but I found out from my wife later on in the evening 
that he asks the question, what does flock off Cantona mean? <laughs> it was quite weird. <laughs> Next week, we'll be looking back at Everton's mercurial Duncan McKenzie. Need him again. Oh, he's giving it away to McKenzie. Now, can McKenzie make this four for Everton? And he can, and he made it look like child's play. And Chelsea, a club who had class players like Alan Hudson, and a manager who looks suspiciously like Jason King. That's it for tonight. I'd like to thank all my guests. We're going to trudge off to the Players' Lounge, and hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Good night. And Brian Moore is back in two weeks' time, next week, World Championship Boxing. Goal years this Tuesday, 7 30.